Right, let's get back to some really big mofos. And discussions on the biggest theropod in my previous videos have thrown around this name a lot. Now, I've avoided mentioning it up until now for reasons I will get into, but I'm not going to make you guys wait any longer. Let's talk about the Lord of the Lizard Eaters, Saurophaganax. All the way back in 1931, a man by the name of John Willis Stovall discovered material from a very big theropod in Oklahoma, but it took a further 10 years for him to name it as Saurophagus Maximus. This, however, didn't count. As not only was this in an article without a proper description, the genus name was actually already occupied by a type of tyrant flycatcher. So this material was put under a nomen dubium right up until 1995, when Daniel Turi made an official description of the material naming it Saurophaganax maximus. So what kind of dinosaur was the official state fossil of Oklahoma? Saurophaganax was a fairly typical member of the Allosauridae, having a bipedal stance on powerful hind limbs, with three clawed forelimbs strong enough to possibly play a part in grasping prey. The distinction from other theropods can be seen in the Allosaurid skull. Like all the other members, Saurophaganax had a pair of crests running along the top of its skull, peaking just before the eye sockets. This skull would also have had partial cranial kinesis, meaning the articulation allowed for the skull to be flexible, so it could likely open its jaws excessively wide and swallow some pretty sizable chunks of meat. In fact, it was suspiciously close to Allosaurus. Again, I'll get into that soon enough. What truly really sets Saurophaganax apart is its size. This Allosaurid grew to be around 10.5 meters or 34 feet in length, but the confusion seems to be with this guy's weight. The first page of Google will often cite weight estimates of up to 8.5 tons, but the basis for this doesn't appear to represent an average. One specimen of Saurophaganax consisting of a single distal tibia, or the bottom of the main shin bone, has been used to give a size estimate of around 8.3 tons in weight, and possibly up to 43 feet in length. Now the tibia is not something that varies a huge amount within a family of theropods, so can often be a more reliable size extrapolation than, say, teeth but it still can vary a little and this is a pretty small portion of the animal. It is around the same size as that of T-Rex, but we have loads of specimens of that dinosaur to get a more reliable size estimate. But even if this is giving a close to accurate size estimate, this is a huge individual and not the average. This would be like looking at Andre the Giant and saying that humans often grow to 7 foot 3 and 520 pounds. Look, I'm not saying that crowning Saurophaganax as a mega theropod is unfounded, but I think giving a weight estimate of 8.3 tonnes without any other context is kind of giving the wrong impression. On average, the current estimates place Saurophaganax at around 3 to 5 tonnes, but certainly not commonly larger than 6. So this doesn't place it right up there with some of the biggest theropods in history that I've talked about before, but it does still make Saurophaganax probably the largest theropod from the Jurassic and certainly the biggest predator from the Morrison Formation. Speaking of the Morrison Formation, this is the formation that Saurophaganax was found in and barely needs an introduction as one of the most famous Jurassic formations. Found across the midwest of North America, this formation dates to between 156.3 to 146.8 million years ago. This was a subtropical area rich with rivers, streams, lakes and floodplains. In particular, the northern parts of the Morrison Formation show a wide range of lowland swamps, which gradually thinned out into the southern regions which show more arid deserts of which hit peak temperatures of around 40 to 50 degrees Celsius. But it's the fossil content that is world-renowned in this region for being one of the most well-studied and dinosaur-rich sites in the world. This area first hit fame when some of the world's most famous dinosaurs were named in quick succession during the infamous Bone Wars, which I talk more about here. Living here alongside Saurophaganax was a variety of freshwater fish, amphibians, small mammals and reptiles such as turtles, sphenodonts, snakes and lizards along with a variety of crocodilians, some of which were fully terrestrial. Pterosaurs here include Harpactognathus, Kepodactylus, and Mesodactylus, whilst the dinosaurs include names we've all heard of. Ornithopods include Camptosaurus, Dryosaurus, Nanosaurus, and Euteodon. Thyreophorans had names such as Gargoyolosaurus, Mimoropelta, Hesperosaurus, and of course, Stegosaurus. Whilst the sauropods here, much like many places during the Jurassic, were extremely abundant. Here we had Camarasaurus, Brachiosaurus, Supersaurus, Diplodocus, Barosaurus, Atlantosaurus, Apatosaurus, and Brontosaurus. The last two of which did now both exist and were separate genera as I explained here. But of course, you needed something to eat them. 
On the smaller end we had Ornithelestes, Stoxosaurus, Kyparion and Hesperonothoides. As we get a little bigger we see Ceratosaurus and Marchosaurus and on the biggest end Torvosaurus and Allosaurus. And it is Allosaurus that is of interest here. The only real notable difference at a glance between Saurophaganax and Allosaurus is the larger size and more robust nature of the animal. It's so similar in fact that paleontologists to this day are split almost down the middle as to whether this should be Saurophaganax maximus or an additional species of Allosaurus, in which case it would be Allosaurus maximus. And this is the reason that I've been somewhat hesitant to throw Saurophaganax as one of the biggest theropods. Mostly because the 8 ton range is generally considered an outlier, and the fact that if the matter settles in favour of a fourth species of Allosaurus, Saurophaganax didn't actually exist. But I'm reserving my scepticism because I am not an Allosaur expert, nor have I actually studied these bones myself, and the official consensus as of recording this is that Saurophaganax is indeed its own genus. So that's what I'm going to go with for the rest of this video. Specifically cited as the diagnostic feature is what is known as the parasagittal lamina, which are essentially ridges running along either side of the neural spines of the vertebrae, which were also very high. Another difference highlighted are what have been called meat chopper tail chevrons. These are the little bones running alongside the underside of the tail vertebrae, which in Allosaurus are fairly long and thin, but the Saurophaganax are shaped more like an axe head. So how true was Saurophaganax's title as the Lord of Lizard Eaters? Well, here we have another theropod that paleontologists might think show that sauropods weren't all that tough. The Morrison Formation, as mentioned before, was dominated by very large sauropods, the largest of which were the likes of Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus. Remains of Apatosaurus specifically have shown feeding traces that match those that would have been left by Saurophaganax, showing possible hunting if it wasn't being scavenged. It's actually been suggested that Saurophaganax was actually a scavenging specialist, being too big and slow to actually catch anything, instead using its massive size to bully others away from their kill. Now you might call me a contrarian, but I am also not 100% convinced by this either. Most predators aren't going to turn down a free meal, especially when they're big enough to scare anything else off and Saurophaganax was indeed slow, given the size and relatively underdeveloped nature of the fourth trochanters, which are the bumps and the femur in which the caudofemoralis muscle is attached, the dinosaur equivalent of the glutes. Thing is, Saurophaganax wasn't the only big slow animal here. There were plenty of sauropods, which, especially as sub-adults, would have been pretty fair game for Saurophaganax, and Stegosaurus was most definitely not famous for its speed. Saurophaganax simply wouldn't have needed to have been a fast animal if it was hunting these dinosaurs, using its scary bite force of 10,000 newtons, equivalent to that of a great white shark. It turns out that not many herbivores had much to worry about with Saurophaganax, considering it's not actually found in very much abundance. The specific localities in which Saurophaganax has been found in have only ever been in the uppermost layers of this formation, or the youngest layers. Because of this, Saurophaganax is thought to have only existed at the end of the formation, without much evidence, though it's not impossible, of sharing its formation with the likes of Torvosaurus, Ceratosaurus, or even Allosaurus. So is this a direct descendant of Allosaurus, showing how big the group could have gotten had things not gone wrong for it at the end of the Jurassic? Who knows? Let me know what you think down below whilst I answer today's question, which comes from Jack Murray 764 Most smashable dinosaur- okay. Right, let's try that again, hopefully with something a little more relevant to the science of paleontology. Uh, okay, Rob Canisto 8635 how is your love life? Come on! Okay, third option to stop me turning into a carry-on character. Okay, this one comes from patron Gregory Eaton, who has asked, There was a time when the idea of dinosaurs having anything but scaly, lizard-like skin was considered absolute, and any discussion of body covering, feathers or something hair-like, was derided. Are there current absolute beliefs in dinosaur morphology or behaviour which you believe could stand some thoughtful reconsideration? Ooh, I like this one. Okay. So, yes, I think there is plenty that will be reconsidered in the next few years. Thing is with non-avian dinosaurs is that there is really nothing like them around today that we can look to. Yes, we have birds as the closest thing, but when you look at the whole group, there's plenty that are nothing like them and behaviour especially is something that would have varied almost infinitely. Physical appearance is something that we're pretty sturdy on now, with the exception of maybe some soft tissue or display structures. 
but I think behavior is the next big obstacle. So I think the way that we currently view them is as these sort of bird reptile hybrids and anything behavior wise just kind of falls somewhere in the middle of the two. Can't really blame us since behavior is not really something that is directly preserved in the fossil record. But I do think as more findings are made and technology advances, we'll be able to find things on these animals that might drastically change how we currently think they may have behaved. And find out that rather than being mostly bird-like, we might find something that puts them back into the category of weird alien creatures. I know the present is a window into the past and all that, and I can't even begin to speculate what kind of behaviours that these might have shown. But I do think that if and when we find out more about dinosaur or even pterosaur behaviour, it's going to drastically change how we view them. Anyway, thank you for submitting that question as well as all of my other patrons for their support. And thank you to everyone else for watching this video. Please consider liking and subscribing and I will catch you guys next time.